a week or two ago, uh, after we put the kids down to bed, and I was sitting on the couch, and our couch faces our kitchen, and I, I can't remember what I was doing. I was reading something or eating something, and out of my peripheral, I saw something scurry across the floor. It's like, okay, and go check this out here. Lo and behold, yes, there was a, a mouse, and it was under the stove. You get over there, it ran out over into the kitchen. For something with such short legs, they're very fast. Uh, went into the kitchen, or went into the bathroom, and uh, there's no way I was going to be able to get it. It was under the vanity, so I went and got uh, a mouse trap, put some nice, fresh peanut butter on it, set it in there, and waited. And about an hour or two later, I heard it. I'm like, all right, let's go see what we, what we have here. And, oh yeah, I got him. Got him good. Uh, the hunger of the mouse had enticed it as it uh, smelled the nice peanut butter. and It was too much of a temptation to pass up. It looked good, smelled good, but brought death. Sin can be enticing. The enemy masquerades as an angel of light. The fruit of the garden, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, and, and let me say that again, goodness. The fruit that was on the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it looked good, it looked desirable. Uh, it looked like it was full of life and pleasure and wisdom, but it brought death. St. Augustine, in his famous work, Confessions, speaks about his own war with sin in a vivid way. In describing a, a moment that the Lord was working in his life, he says this, But there was no place where I could escape from myself. And in this way, you brought me face to face with myself once more, forcing me upon my own sight so that I should see my wickedness and loathe it. I had known it all along. But I had always pretended that it was something different. I had turned a blind eye and forgotten it. He describes his falling into sin as a turning of a blind eye and forgetting it. He loved his sin. He wanted to keep it because it had enticed him. It had enslaved him with his own desire. He was pretending that it was something different. This, this is the deceitfulness of sin. We can just be just, just like Augustine. We're able to pretend that our sin is something other than what it is. We can even call our sin good. He goes on to say, I prayed to you for chastity and said, Give me chastity and continence, but not yet. For I was afraid that you would answer my prayer at once and cure me too soon of the disease of lust, which I wanted satisfied, not quelled. I had wandered on along the road of vice and the sacrilegious superstition of the Manichees, not because I thought that it was right, but because I preferred it to the Christian belief, which I did not explore as I ought, but opposed out of malice. So we can see the, the struggle that is happening within his heart. He's a man who's wrestling with his vices. On our own, we don't have the strength to set ourselves free, but thanks be to God who delivers us. That while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, God made us alive in Christ. By grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man can boast. There's a specific temptation that our text this morning warns us of and gives us instruction of how to stay away from it. A couple weeks ago, we looked at Psalm 10, Psalm of Lament. That lament started out with questioning God about where he is and what he's doing as the psalmist looks around and sees the behavior of the wicked and how they are prospering. It doesn't make sense. The wicked are taking advantage of people. It looks like they're getting away with it. God, where are you? How can it be that the wicked seem to flourish and gain rewards in this life as they're doing so much evil? Psalm 10 ends with a reminder that God is close to his people and that justice is coming for the wicked. God can be trusted to care for his people. 
Now fast forward to Psalm 37. This psalm speaks about a temptation that can come as we look and see the, pro- the, the wicked prospering. And this temptation is to envy the wicked. To look at the wicked, see them getting earthly rewards and say, they don't deserve that. I deserve that. I should have that. Not them. And then a dangerous seed of envy is planted in our heart and begins to grow. By God's grace, we must root this out. This morning, we're going to answer three questions. First, what is envy? Second, why should we not envy? And third, what are some practical steps of how to guard our own heart against envy? So if you haven't already, turn to Psalm 37. We're going to read this and and we'll pray. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For the evil doers shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times and The days of famine they have abundance, but the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastors. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. For those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is never lending, he, he is ever lending generously, and his children become a blessing. Turn away from evil and do good, so shall you dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice, he will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the children of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. The Lord will not abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when he wants... You will look on when the wicked are cut off. I have seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree, but he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. Mark the blameless, and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. But transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in, time of, in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Lord, we look to you this morning and desire that you'd be working in our heart. Lord, I ask that you draw us to you, that we would be conformed more and more into the image and likeness of Christ. Amen.
Verse 1, fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. There's two commands here, and the first one needs a little explanation, but it will help us to set up the conversation about envy and how envy, envy practically shows up in our heart and life. So when I see the word fret, I tend to think of being afraid, fear. Uh, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. It looks like it's saying, do not be afraid. And there's plenty of passages that encourage us to not be afraid. And I want to encourage that. Uh, Trust in the Lord. He's in control. Uh, Psalm 27.1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? However, this fret is talking about something different. The word for fret is the same word that is used to describe the type of anger that Cain had when God took no regard for his offering in Genesis 4, uh, verse 5 and 7, which says, But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So we're getting a glimpse of the heart of Cain here. And from this conversation, we can tell that Cain knew what was expected of him. God tells Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But Cain has rejected the commands of God and is now very angry. To use the terminology of the psalm, Cain is fretting himself. He is stirring up a burning anger within himself. And look at his disposition. His face falls. His countenance is down. He's not received what he wants from God. For Cain, this ultimately leads to a heart that is so resentful and so angry that he's willing to murder his brother and then lie to God about it. So this word fret is speaking about a, it's a burning type of anger to heat oneself into a, a type of vexation and resentment. Fret not yourself. We are able to stir ourselves up when there's something we don't like or we see evildoers doing their evil. We're to be angry and not sin. But when we stir ourselves up into a heat and into a resentment, This tends to evil. We see this word again in Psalm 37, verse 8. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Not all anger is sinful. We're commanded to be angry and not sin. But anger can be sinful, even if it's only in our heart as we stir up wrath, stir up bitterness, jealousy, resentment, envy. There's a ruminating There's a meditating, uh, continually reflecting upon whatever the thing is that uh, we're wanting. Uh, There can be a a brooding bitterness that hardens our heart and that tends towards evil. To fret is to cultivate and grow a heart that has an inward orientation about the desires and passions within that leads to an unholy anger. And scripture is showing us a standard where this Inward stirring up of the heart uh, towards anger is is not a characteristic of godliness. We can deceive ourselves by thinking that sin is only truly bad if it's out in the open. But be reminded that the Lord sees the heart. He can see the bitterness. He can see the resentment, uh, the sinful anger that we cultivate inside ourselves even as we're able to hide it from others, even as we put a mask on and, and smile. We need to repent of the sin that's in our heart, even if it doesn't burst out into the open in front of everybody. We need God to change our heart. It's only a matter of time before our heart is exposed, either to others in in this life, but ultimately to the Lord in the end. So this first command is telling us to not burn with sinful anger because of the wicked. Now we come to the second command, Be not envious of wrongdoers. So let's take a moment to think about envy. There's a number of words and and issues with the heart that are at play with each other when it comes to envy. So some other similar words to envy would include covetousness, 
jealousy. Although they do have some subtle differences, but they all come to play within an envious heart. So, Thou shall not covet is one of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the more unique commandments as well because it's a command that has to do with the inward heart desire that isn't necessarily an outward action. To covet something is to have an inordinate desire for something that is not yours to have. The explanation in Exodus 20, 17 has to do with desiring your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife. It's someone else's stuff. There is something that somebody else has that's theirs that you're desiring to have as your own. It's not necessarily wrong to desire good things, but our desires get out of order when we see something that is not ours to have and we want it for ourselves. That's coveting. Jesus says in Luke 12, 15, And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Trying to find fulfillment in life through the means of gathering material possessions is idolatry. Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. A created thing will never provide everything you need when it comes to the fulfillment of your soul. It was not made for that, and you were not made for that. We were made to be in relationship with our creator God. In Christ is where there is true fulfillment. A covetous, a covetous heart is looking for fulfillment in something other than the Lord, and it can lead to further sinful action, such as stealing, that all began with desiring something that was not yours, eyeing someone else's belongings and desiring it for yourself. Now, jealousy is used a couple ways in Scripture. Jealousy can be a zeal for something that belongs to you. This is why we read about how God is a jealous God. He is deserving of all worship and praise. He has a righteous jealousy. All glory and worship belongs to him. He is jealous to have what is rightfully his. We also see this written about in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 4 and 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." There can be a righteous jealousy, but there is also a sinful jealousy that has a lot to do with comparing ourselves with others. When we see someone who has something that we want, it moves beyond the possession itself, and it becomes about the person who owns the possession. So we can be jealous of a person because they have something that we want, whereas coveting is about wanting the possession that doesn't belong to you. Acts 7, 9 is a helpful example uh, of this. It says, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him. So they were jealous of Joseph. It became personal. It became about Joseph. Jealousy has to do with the person, while coveting has to do with the possession. Coveting and sinful jealousy are bad enough, but envy turns the dial up a little more. Envy looks at someone, covets what they have, and burns with a resentment and bitterness against the person. So there's anger involved as envy hates that somebody else would have the thing that they want. Envy is a sin that drove the the Jewish leaders to arrest and crucify Jesus. Matthew 27, 15 says... Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And so there's this scene that's set up where Pilate offers Barabbas and Jesus and asks the crowd to choose between the two. In verse 18, it says, For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. The chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to then 
choose Barabbas because they envy Jesus. And then they stir up the people to shout for the crucifixion of Jesus. So envy is full of malice. It's full of hatred. And this sin moved forward the the crucifixion of, of Jesus Christ. Guard your heart from falling into the trap of envy. It brings strife, it brings malice, it brings death. Part of the temptation to envy the wicked is when we see the wicked prospering, to look at them and say, they don't deserve that. In fact, I deserve that more than them. I should be the person who has that. I hate that they have that. I hate them. Be careful of your heart. If we all got what we deserve, we'd be receiving the wrath of God. It's what we deserve. God is just, and the evil will receive judgment. And so this moves us into thinking about the reasons why we should not envy. The first and most obvious reason is that God commands us to not envy. Don't take God's commands lightly. Uh, This is... Simple to the point, um, really should be enough for us to guard our heart against envy. God means what he says. Uh, He is the one who defines good and evil. He knows how life works. He knows how life is to flourish because he created it. He knows that envy is destructive and evil. And so he commands us to not envy in order that we would glorify him rather than glorifying ourselves. Secondly, the wicked are going to face judgment. Yes, they may have some nice earthly treasures. They may be receiving some prosperous outcomes here on earth. But they do not have a valuable end. Fame and fortune are bad saviors. There is no eternal value with uh, earthly prosperity. Look at what becomes of the, of the wicked. Verse 2. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. This is a theme that is repeated throughout the psalm. It keeps reminding us of what is going to come of the wicked. It's a gracious reminder from God about the judgment that awaits the wicked, and that we would be fools to follow in their footsteps. We would be foolish to envy them. You don't actually want what's coming to them, because what is coming is judgment. So here's a few of the verses from from the psalm that speak of this. Verse 10, In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. So all the stuff that the wicked acquired with his prosperity outlasts him. His prosperous home had kept his riches and wealth, but it was not able to keep his life. His prosperity was not able to keep him from death. He's not there anymore. Verses 12 and 13. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draws the sword and, and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. This is not a kind of laughter that we want to receive. God laughs as he knows what's coming to the wicked, as they are in their pride gnashing their teeth against the righteous. And what the wicked think is advancing them, their sword, their bow, their their tools and weapons that they believe are bringing them prosperity will ultimately kill them. This is the great lie of sin, just like the It's like the nice peanut butter on the mousetrap. It it offers life. It offers sustenance. It offers prosperity. It offers pleasure. But it kills you. It it destroys you. And as you destroy others. The reminders continue. Verse 20. But the wicked will perish. The enemies of the Lord are like the glory of the pastors. They vanish. Like smoke, they vanish away. Verse 35. I've seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree, but he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. Verse 38, But transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. 
A reason to not envy the wicked is because of the end that they will receive. This is to have an eternal perspective as we are viewing life around us. Um, Their end is not desirable. They are going to receive the righteous judgment of God because of their wrongdoing. Even though they may be prospering on this side of eternity, they will not be prospering forever. Do not envy the wicked or choose to follow in their footsteps. You will bring judgment upon yourself even if you find prosperity in this life. So now the question becomes, how do we guard our heart against envy? How do we do that? So I have nine ways, and don't worry, it's not going to be really long, okay, I promise. I have nine ways from the passage uh, to help us guard our heart against envy. First, trust in the Lord. See this in verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. A heart that trusts in God is a heart that is far from envy because a heart that trusts God is looking to the Lord to satisfy and provide rather than looking towards material possessions. When we trust in the Lord, we're not trusting in our own strength. Covetousness, jealousy, envy are often found in a heart that is relying upon its own strength and is not satisfied. A trusting heart is a thankful heart. A good example of this is in Ecclesiastes 4, chapter 4, verse 4, which says, Then I saw that all toil and all skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This, is also, this also is vanity in a striving after the wind. So when you see your neighbor or someone in your family or getting something, and there can be this competitive desire to have that, uh, just like they do, to show that you're just as well off. Uh, envying our, our neighbors, uh, relying upon our own strength for our work and, and toil, but for what? It's vanity. This is not what matters in life. Um, trust in the Lord. And the verse says to do good. Let that be enough. So what if you don't have the newest gadget? Do what is good. Dwell in the land. Befriend faithfulness. Let faithfulness be the friend that walks beside you instead of envy. Second, delight in the Lord. This is verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we delight ourselves in the Lord, then we aren't going to be looking to created things to satisfy our heart. It's that simple, and it's also that hard. (laughs) Um, True delight, true joy, true satisfaction is only going to come in Christ. When our delight is in the Lord, then we will receive what our heart desires, which is him. Delighting ourselves in the Lord is not a formula to try to get what your heart really truly desires. God won't be mocked. He can't be fooled. God is not a vending machine where we put something in in order to get something out. Delight yourself in the Lord. Third, commit your way to the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Making a commitment can keep you from staying off, from straying off in another direction. When you're truly committed to something, you don't steer to the left or to the right of it. You stay on course. You hold fast when something else comes up that looks good. Commitment is loyalty. This is why commitment goes a long way along with the, with the trust in the Lord. He will act in his good purpose. When we are committed to Christ, it's easier to say no to the passions of the flesh because our feelings and our desires are not what's running our life. That's not what we're committed to. Instead, we're committed to standing on the firm foundation of Christ. Fourth, be still before the Lord and wait. Verse 7, be still before the Lord and and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. So be still. This is a, that's a difficult calling in our day and age. It's a hectic world. The last thing we want to do is be still. And notice how being still 
comes after trusting in the Lord, after delighting yourself in the Lord, and after committing yourself to the Lord. You are not going to be able to be still before the Lord and wait for him if these other things are not happening in your life. If you're not trusting God, then it's likely that you're trusting in yourself uh, and prone to work yourself up into a frenzy while trying to control something. So, yes, we're, we're responsible. We are to be wise, but trust in the Lord. He is sovereign. He is good. If you're not delighting yourself in the Lord, then you're seeking after, you're not seeking after him. You're seeking after other delights. Uh, this means you're not waiting patiently for him. You've taken matters into your own hands, which is, that's not stillness before the Lord. And if you're not committed to the Lord, you will not be still before him or wait for him. Your heart is committed elsewhere. It will be easily drawn away. Patience requires trust. Being still before the Lord requires you to trust that he will act in his time and you will receive what you need in his time. When we try to take matters into our own hands, we make a mess of things. That's what Abraham did with, with Hagar. Instead of being patient, and God was asking him to wait a long time, instead of being patient, he took matters into his own hands and had a son with Hagar. And we see the, the chaos that rang even into this day. Proverbs 14, uh, verse 30 says, A tranquil heart brings life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. A tranquil, tranquil heart. It's a peaceful heart, a still heart. And this is, this is a heart disposition. You can be a busy person and have a still heart. Be still before the Lord and wait. He cares for his people. He sent Jesus to die for his people. So the call to be still is a call to rest in our gracious Lord. And fifth, refrain from anger. Verse 8, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. James 1, 19-20 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Because anger, malice, bitterness, and resentment can be so tangled up with envy, a way to steer clear of envies to keep control on how you respond with anger. So that includes not only our outward expression of anger, but the ruminating, the boiling uh, within our heart and in our mind. The anger of man is an anger that is first and foremost, foremost about what I want more than what God wants. The anger of man is not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, but is seeking to build a kingdom for self. This is where envy comes in. Having our eyes set on somebody else's kingdom, uh, desiring their kingdom for our own, becoming bitter, uh, coveting the things that they have. Uh, refrain, refrain from this. Keep yourself from this type of anger. Do not allow the passions of your flesh to control you. Sixth, turn away from evil and do good. This is verse 27. It says, Turn away from evil and do good, so shall you dwell forever. When you turn away from something, you're no longer looking at it. Gazing upon the wicked and all of their stuff, that's not going to help your heart. Turn away and, and fix your eyes on Christ. Be, be faithful in setting out to do good. The good that God has prepared you to do in advance. And as you're doing the good that God has called you to do, it will keep you from evil. And seven and eight are a pair. They go together. Speak wisely and hide the word of the Lord in your heart. Look at verses 30 and 31. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. And what does speaking have to do with envy? Our tongue betrays our heart. Our tongue shows what's in our heart. If we're hiding God's word in our heart, then there's going to be wisdom that comes off of our tongue as we speak. A heart of envy 
will often be a heart of complaining, uh, comparing ourselves with others. Uh, comparison and complaining about material possessions, skills and, abil- skills and abilities, the list could go on. It, that's not a heart that's bent towards wisdom. Um, a wise heart will have stored up the word of God in order to not sin against God. It will be a heart and tongue that are filled with thanksgiving and praise. Hide God's words in, in your heart and speak with wisdom. And finally, ninth, remember where you are going. This is back to verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in, in abundant peace. And verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. If you have repented of your sin, if you have believed in Jesus Christ, then the promised land awaits you in glory. Nothing beats this. To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of your life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to be with Jesus forever, what could possibly beat that? To have all of eternity with the Lord. All the other things in this life that we can strive after do not last forever. That stuff is a chasing after the wind. But the Lord is forever. Eternal joy in a right relationship with God forever. And nothing can take that away from his people. Verses 39 and 40, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. The Lord is where we are to run to in in days of trouble. He is a stronghold. He helps. He delivers. He saves Find your refuge in Jesus Christ and the hope that is offered in the gospel. When we fall into envy, we are beginning to cultivate a heart that has no desire for the Lord. Guard your heart against this. Okay, so what are some signs to look for when it comes to envy in our life? How can I tell if I have an envious heart? So as we close, here's some practical questions to consider as we desire to root out envy from our life. Are you excited and encouraging to others when they succeed? Are you excited and encouraging to others when they succeed? Or do you feel insecure or upset at seeing the success of others? Are you insecure and upset when you see the success of others? Being able to celebrate, and this is like a true celebration from your heart, being able to celebrate with someone in their success and achievements, that, that's a sign of a, a healthy heart because you're rejoicing with those who rejoice. You're not rejoicing about uh, something that's just about you. You're, you're rejoicing about them, something that went well with them. You're not making it about yourself. You're, you're celebra- celebrating somebody else's successes. Do you feel a need to tear people down? Do you feel a need to tear people down? You know, I, I'm going to, I see that achievement over there that this person did. I'm going to try to make that look like it's not as great as it is. Um, seeking to diminish the work of others when instead it should be celebrated. Are, are you diminishing what, something has, what somebody else has done? Um, when somebody else gets a gift, are you happy for them? Or is there a little bit of a, what about me, Um, when the gift is given? Are you able to be glad for somebody else when they receive something that's awesome? How often do you think about life not being fair and allow this to affect your mood? Be careful not to fret yourself, to stir up your own heart into a place of anger and resentment. How thankful and content are you? A thankful heart and a content heart is not going to be a heart that's prone to envy. The truth is that there are times that we have all been envious in some way. What are we to do? Find some encouragement and hope here. In Titus 3, verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, 
slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is what we are to do. Rest upon the promises of God. Repent and believe in Jesus. He is mighty to save. He's mighty to change us from people who are foolish and envious of others and wash us and renew us with the Holy Spirit, giving us eternal hope and eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful that you are a God who is mighty to, slay, mighty to save. <clears throat> Lord, we ask that you would help us to have hearts that are free from envy, that we would not look at the wicked and stir up our hearts in, in a sinful anger, that we would instead be marked as people who find our delight in you, and that we would be encouraging uh, to others, Lord. So help us to guard our heart. We pray this in your name. Amen.